Um, Osa Helena Scherner is a Swedish artist using sound and listening as her artistic modes of exploration. Through her site-specific installation, she explores sound's potential, making the embedded conditions and underlying narratives connected to a situation perceivable, drawing connections between past and present, local and global, as well as human and more than human. By this, she seeks to reframe the act of listening, evoking a sensibility of places as complex ecologies. Also active as an artistic researcher, she's been specifically interested in exploring the contemporary conditions of sonic situated practice and its ability of being transformative, i.e. what it actually means to make a difference in the era of Anthropocene and advanced capitalism. Guided by methodologies of feminism, ecosophy and posthumanism, she proposes an understanding of site specificity as an aesthetic ethical practice and engagement between specific and diverse bodies with agencies, human as well as non-human, spanning across and connecting the material, social, discursive, artistic and technical realms at the same time in a given situation. Shana has participated in an extensive number of exhibitions internationally and her works include several public permanent commissions um, that hopefully she's going to talk about today. Um, and Shana represents professorship um, in sound art at the Hochschule für Bildende Kunst in Braunschweig, Germany, 2020 to 2021. Is that still ongoing then? It, it finished you know? last, it finished two weeks actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So now I'm a happy, happy, happy post postdoc researcher. Okay, nice. Wonderful. But I'm going to tell you well, all. Thank you very much for being here, um, Osa, and I will hand over to you. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank you very much, Annie, for inviting me to this uh, exciting environment. And we talked a little bit just before we, you let everyone in. We talked about the post uh, post Corona uh, situation when it comes to Zoom and that one feel a bit uh, unused to be in present. But I think one of the fa fantastic things with the post, shall we call it, post Corona Zoom uh, situation is that I can actually sit in my village, little village in Sweden and, and, and it can be streamed to you. Uh, I think we, 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 after Corona now, we much more see the potential of just not always going here and there, but we can, we can be where we are, so to speak. Um, but as just Annie, Annie uh, g gave a, a brief presentation uh, of my artistship as well as re research that I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. And just as Annie said, uh, I just come come from a, from a guest professorship uh, uh, in sound art at the Hobika in Braunschweig, um, and I'm just continuing my uh, it's an international postdoc research project on 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 art art um, and science related to the Arctic that I, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in a, in a moment. Um, but I'm going to start to start to share the screen, the very crucial moment, and I hope everything will work right now. Just a moment to see what happens. That is um, just a little, little moment. There we are. I hope this might work. Um, yeah, um, before I share share the PowerPoint with you, uh, I just want to say that um, for me, there are no silly questions, no stupid questions. So whatever that comes to your mind during my presentation, just write it in the chat or just save it for later on and 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 and, and speak it out afterwards uh, just so you know in the case you feel uncomfortable otherwise um i hope that you see uh the presentation now perfect that's a very good beginning um so um yeah i'm, I'm going to show you a few glimpses on my artistship but i'm i'm actually going to start with a little let's see a little uh just just a little film documentation from my postdoctoral project. I'm not going to tell you so much about it right now. I will follow it up in the end of this presentation. Just a little tuning in, so to speak. It's just a few minutes.
Okay, I will come back to this work a bit later on, but that was a kind of tuning in and it's also a good way to know if the uh, sound works or not. So we, so we got that solved already from the beginning. Um, yeah, just as any any uh, kind of when when you did my presentation. So I, I've been working as a uh, installation artist for quite many years, around fifteen years. Uh, I've been working specifically with the sound and listening as as my artistic mood of presentation, and I've been doing around I think it's around thirty thirty site specific projects by now. I will actually always. Or, or almost feel like a dinosaur when 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 realizing how many projects they are, and it, it, it's basically both long term process uh, processes like uh, public uh, uh, permanent sound installations, uh, with a process that takes around up to five years actually, but also uh, uh, short term processes. But but what what really share all these uh, these uh, projects? Uh, is the emphasis or interest in how you can actually transform the experience of a site or a situation through sound. Um, yeah, some, some, some of them been like only using one speaker, monochannel works, or, or sometimes I've been working uh, with, with like, yeah, up to 40, 50 speakers uh, to create a kind of immersed experience. Uh, but but it, they all kind of share the same uh, aim of, of, of uh, transform, the, the sound's transformative uh, capacity, so to speak. Um, this, uh, yeah, the presentation or this picture, I don't know if you can see the arrow, but it, when I talk about sites, uh, could, it, could, it, it relates to environments in a very, very uh, broad way from uh, the library as a site for explore, exploration or environment to the weather phenomena or uh, a whole ocean actually as a uh, site for investigation. So, so it differs entirely, actually. Um, and I think that uh, this also um, implies uh, we very often when we talk about sound art or when sound, sonic practices from from the outside perspective, you talk about the the sound, sounding results. But uh, from my pr perspective as a practitioner, it's very much about the shall we call it the um, neglected, very, very tiny processes on site, uh, something that is really not taken for granted and no one uh, outside you, you yourself as an artist, uh, um, have a, have, you, you, people don't have a clue about what, what, how much the way you can, for instance, install a loudspeaker cable or not, how much that actually affects the practice and that it is not only about installing a cable, but it is really an effective uh, interrelational process us uh, an engagement with the site in question. Um, so yeah, the pre this work is from a, a cemetery, uh, a project uh, called, uh, I don't know how to translate it into English from German, I think it would be uh, an ocean of heartbeats, Ein Meer aus Herzschlag, where I, I installed almost one kilometers uh, uh, loudspeaker cable. Uh, to make it, um, yeah, uh, and, and dig that down in, in the cemetery with a lot of speakers to create an uh, immersive uh, experience. And um, this is a picture from the Oslo uh, Opera, where I uh, installed another piece many years ago, uh, where you basically transform the wooden panel into uh, a, a possible, uh, yeah, stand for, for speakers. So it's very much about looking at what, what is not there yet, but how things, the, uh, what, what, how, the virtual or possibilities within a sound can be can be uh, transformed. Uh, this is another example from the uh, work The Well. Uh, at, this is a permanent installation that is installed in the Swedish Institute in Paris. It's a it's a dried out well. Uh, where I basically, if we're talking about not so much about the concept now, but more about the technical ex aspects, uh, I, I installed a. a uh, a mono channel uh, work uh, in the well um, and you think that should be very very easy it's, it means that it is only one speaker if you compare to the previous works that I showed that are really multi-channel installations but of course uh, uh, stone walls do also have their uh, agency so it was really really tricky and vivid dialogue with the stone of the wall in order to decide how to how to create to create the sonic piece so it's really not about uh, site specificity is 
is really not about just installing speakers or installing cable into a empty uh, space, but it's really an engagement or an ex I would call it an experimental practice, which can never be uh, repeated again, but, but always needs to be, be uh, invented again and again in relation to that specific site. Um, yeah, that's from below the, the, uh, the well. I thought it was a nice picture, so I just sh showed it too. Yeah. Um, this is in Swedish, so I do not expect you to read it, but I can translate tiny, tiny bits from it. Uh, because I just said that I found that site specificity or working with uh, installations in, in basically on site or in public space. It's an experimental practice that cannot be, be repeated. It needs always to be tested out in, in close relation to the site. Um, but this is, a, this is a kind of call for three new uh, sonic works in a hospital in Sweden. Um, and there's a lot of things how the new construct, how the build, uh, the, um, yeah, what do you call it, the, sorry, I always start to think in terms of uh, German words when I, <laughs> I go from Swedish to English, but I, I take my time and hope you have the, have the patience, uh, the hospital. But, but what I actually underlined uh, um, or highlighted in yellow is that they expect uh, that the, in these long waiting launches, they, they are looking for nice and delicate sound art, which should be very relaxing. And I think this very, very much uh, puts focus on the opposite of what I would refer to as site specificity. There is an idea already uh, about how this art should sound. It's a very specific, uh, uh, it's, it's more like uh, really a kind of idea about um, not inventing, uh, not in, not kind of experiment with the site in question, but m more like, uh, should we call it a, a more representational approach to sound, where you basically uh, have an, a clear expectation of the outcome uh, in in terms of commissioner. And I'm, I I don't know how much you can relate to that from your UK perspective, but I've seen this tendency also quite clear in Germany, uh, and I think this is a really Problem, problematization because uh, a problem because on the one hand it's very nice after uh, so many years that uh, sound art or sound as an artistic practice at, finally got acknowledged as an uh, artistic medium but on the other hand this this also kinds of leads to a sort of shall we call it process of normalization where you where you kindly have certain expectation on on what sound as an artistic practice means and should be on what it should represent and i've seen this i don't know if you agree with me annie maybe we can take that uh, discussion later on but it also implicits ideas of what should be be different defined as, as the sonic practice and may, maybe less in, in artistic academias because hopefully we, we have the courage to push the idea of what sound as an artistic practice could be, push it to and uh, push the borders constantly. That's what I think one should do at least. But when it comes to this more, shall we call it commercial commissions, but also commissions made from, um, yeah, art commissioners like uh, festivals or, 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 or and, and these kind of uh, context, I, I see in this vividly that there is a kind of idea of how how it should be. And this made me, uh, and specifically, there is really no uh, insight, I would say, at least when the reason this is the idea why I found it uh, important and kind of is the, shall we call it, point of departure for, for starting to, to do my PhD in, in uh, sound art installation or, or artistic research, to basically investigate the uh, the art or the sound installation and specifically the neglected condition of the practice, uh, what it means to be working with uh, one kilometers of cables, how much that informed the, uh, formed the practice in itself, uh, not only the cable or installation process, but looking to uh, looking for other um, other, shall we call it ideas of how we can um, talk and make visible the this practice and from my perspective i i've been very informed by Deleuze and Guattari um and called uh, basically so so i i wrote and and i i think it was around three years now that i finished the phd called before sound 
transversal processes in site-specific sonic practice. And I think that the, the, the title very, very clearly refer or addresses this, uh, the whole uh, complex process before you actually get the sound out from the whole, uh, yeah, the whole complex entanglement or uh, what, what, what we refer to as the sound work. And I just put this in because I think it's a, it has a, it, it's a bit witty, uh, but I think it's definitely true. What do you not have to do in order to produce a new sound? I could definitely agree on that. Uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of work. Um, so for me, it was very important to find uh, conceptual tools or shall we call it, um, yeah, tools in general to being able to uh, describe my daily practice or the way we can kind of um, critique uh, uh, what I would uh, refer to as simplified ideas of representation when it comes to sound art as a practice. Um, and I think I should say that, I, uh, yeah, never mind. So uh, thinking about, uh, to, thinking in terms of towards a more transversal idea of sound installation, uh, I referred to it in the very beginning of the, this presentation or when I talked about site specificity that it's not about putting in speakers or cables in an empty space, but this kind of really interrelational effective engagement with the, uh, with the site as, as an, yeah, shall we call it process? And that is specifically what I refer to when I talk about transversality, which basically it's a, it's a term coined by, by um, uh, the philosopher and activist um, Felix Guattari in, in the beginning. Um, and from my perspective, it was really important to find to kind of um, find a new format to talk about. On the one hand, the process of site-specific exploration, what it basically means to find a place, doing the whole, shall we call it the whole uh, research project on site, which is of course also a discursive, highly discursive practice. You maybe look into archives, etc., etc., to think about that as a transfer transversal cartography or that it is really about uh, uh, mapping effective um, interrelational processes. It's not really about just finding, uh, finding something. It's not about engagement with dead materia. It's about uh, uh, understanding um, the the practice, the the, the site specific exploration as a very vivid, very active engagement. Again, and um, for many of you, I have no idea if some of you are experts into site specificity. Uh, you might think, yeah, but that's obvious. Yes, it is for us as practitioners, but I promise you, it is really not for commissioners and people in, shall we call it, on the on, on the other hierarchic levels, um, people who take the decisions when it comes to uh, public art. Uh, and it's, now I'm emph emphasizing the sonic arts. So I think that there is a really, really a lot of things to do when it comes about uh, uh, how we can, uh, by, by kind of reformulating the... the our practice, uh, 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 yeah, when it talk about a more di uh, dis uh, discursive and, and how we contextualize this has a very, very important way of how we can talk about our practices. Because, uh, I mean, describing the practices is producing the practice, right? It's not only about, it's, uh, it, it, words are, produ pr uh, are performative in that way. Um, so, and when I talk about another concept or, or a pro, uh, artistic approach that I came up with is also thinking about the artistic design process as a, what I call with the establishing new connections. So again, for, sorry for being maybe repeating myself, but uh, coming with a speaker or coming with a loudspeaker cable uh, and trying to um, yeah, install it in the, for instance, in the cemetery. It's not only about installing the uh, the, the the cable or the loudspeaker. It's about establishing new connection with the with the agencies on site with those uh, those processes or those uh, and and I mean from that new affective relations uh, uh, appear. So thinking about this um, this as a really affective process of entanglements. And another th important thing, which might, we also might take for granted, specifically within art academia, is uh, is the role of the artist subject. Um, I mean, uh, it's we're not we're not an autonomous uh, subject. We're always also 
uh, one agent or one effective force among others when it comes to site specificity. Um, in that sense, I think it's really, really, really uh, crucial to understand your own uh, situated, uh, uh, situated perspective, referring to Donna Haraway now. Um, so the, also the idea of becoming non-autonomous is, is uh, for me, uh, a way of, of like recontextualizing the practice was, was very practical. Um, I feel that this might also be more, I mean, inside specificity and generally in fine arts, this is heavily discussed and I can imagine this might be something you discuss too, but uh, when it comes to electroacoustic music, I still feel that there is a kind of modernist uh, idea of the sound, the work, the space that definitely needs to be, be questioned. Okay, so um, I've been talking quite a lot now uh, and I thought I'm going to show you some processes. But this is a little bit about the theoretical framework that I, that from where I come and why I started with uh, art, artistic research. And um, the last year, I wouldn't say the last years, actually the last decades, I've been specifically interested in the in the idea or the concept of, of the ocean or seas uh, as, a, as a, shall we call it, a public space or a phenomena. Uh, and these uh, four different circles uh, represent, or shall we call it materializes, different uh, kind of traces from projects that I've been doing. Uh, and I'm going to specifically show you one of the projects that I did, did uh, is, uh, as long as 10 years ago. Um, but of course, you can ask, do we really need any more more uh, artists that are working with uh, uh, environmental issues uh, specifically related to seas uh, and from from my perspective i've also been working specifically when i when i talk about the it as a public space it's all very much about environmentalists about the anthropocene and human induced sound and of course you can ask if you if you really need any more even more artists that are doing that because we already have one Jana Vinderen, for instance, or Leah Barclay or, or Jakob Kierkegaard. But uh, from my perspective, uh, I've been very interested in the agency of the technology. And again, thinking, rethinking the documentary practice of site specific art in relation to, to beyond a mere represent, representation, if I may say so. Um, so it's about uh, kind of questioning the idea of sound and authenticity and representation um, and thinking about the agency of, of everything that is involved in uh, documentary practices. So I'm actually going to show you one work now, Currents, uh, from 2011. Um, well, yeah, that's a very, very short explanation, transforming the global warming into a sonic experience, where I explore or investigate artistic sonification as a transversal or slash interrelational affective process. Um, I'm going to just play the documentary now. It's around five minutes and let me know if you can't hear the sound. It will take one minute until you hear a sound. So it's, it's silent in the beginning.
Okay. So, um, some of you might be very, very familiar with the idea of sonification. For some of you, you might be wondering, sitting there as questions mark, have no idea. So, uh, sonification is basically, I mean, uh, I think everyone can relate to sonification. If you look at the, the, all those films where you basically are sonifying heartbeats, beats, it's, you know, soap, soap operas where someone is, went through a car accident and you're in the hospital and they're taking the, uh, you can see these heart, heart rates on the screen and you can hear the beep and the beep. That is basically a sonification where you basically uh, translate an uh, inaudible data into sound. And there is a kind of standard, uh, uh, shall we call it a classical uh, so classical um, uh, handbook uh, of, of sonification, uh, which is was written around, I think it's all uh, maybe more than five years ago now. And for some reason, I can't remember it. But if you want to, I can I can send you a link afterwards or not, <laughs> depending if you're interested. But sonification used trad traditionally to be, to be defined as a subtype of a broader category of audio display, which uses non-speech audio material to represent information. And if we uh, apply this on the work with currents, uh, IU basically use sound to represent information about the North Atlantic current, according to a classical idea of sonification, translating un or un uh, inaudible data or information into sound. But and this is also part of my, my artistic research project that I think that there is a huge problem with established tradition of representations when it comes to, uh, I'm talking about artistic sonification here now, uh, because that's, it's a really, really broad, uh, broad and wide field. So uh, let, let's focus on artistic sonification now, because uh, as artists, we want to engage, we want to say, we want to give the environment uh, like a agency uh, to the environment, right? We want to um, give a voice to the env uh, environmental issues. We work with field recordings and, uh, and, and with sonification. That is two kind of classical, shall we call it, methods of working uh, with uh, documentary practices. But in the uh, notion of, uh, shall we call it, documentaries, there is a very strong link to the idea of representation, thinking about that we make a mere translation. Uh, and I mean, technology has a high, really high uh, agency here in, 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 in that act, but we can talk about that later on. But this is a kind of critique that I I, I've been interested in to 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 investigate, and I did that in in this uh, uh, PhD project, and I would t uh, tell you a little bit more about it uh, in uh, in the project that I I'm doing right now. Um, but let's go back to currents. What, what was it actually about? I think I have to remind myself actually almost. So it starts somewhere here. Can you can you see this arrow? Okay, because I can't see it, but. Uh, yeah, here it is, the red spot that's somewhere north of the Faroe Islands, where the this research project is basically measuring, making measurement of the North Atlantic current and how fast or whatever they do, they can translate the activity uh, of the North Atlantic current and they can basically uh, giving kind of make analysis how this relate to the uh, melting process of the of the Arctic ice. Uh, and after that, if uh, there is a series of transformation where it is uh, kind of transformed and of course composed, uh, uh, there's a, a very, very strong, strong process of composition. But for somehow I, I still have, there is still some kind of idea of thinking about the sonification as a representation uh, where, where the work is uh, representing or materializes this material or this process and you can and it's made audible through a compositional process in the Oslo opera um, but this is of course much much more than that because we are artists right uh, and uh, there is a very uh, complex act of uh, I don't know if I would call it uh, translation but a transformation that on the one hand has with a very um, yeah the, the the mapping process itself when you think about this there is an enormous lot of different actors and agencies involved in this spanning from the North Atlantic current to a telecommunication cable uh, uh, there is politics involved uh, in the in in the uh, how what you can do and what you cannot do in the Oslo Opera. I will I will give you a, I will show you a schedule on on that in a little bit. Um, so basically, yeah, this is 
just a slot. We, we can come back to that later on. And it's, all, of course, a, a very, very complex process of, of uh, what I refer to as a, the design process, as a transversal process, where you, I show you this picture before, and it, it connects to this project, where you, 4.30 uh, in the morning, uh, you're basically uh, have two hours to install the loudspeakers, uh, because, um, yeah, uh, you can't do it when the audience is there, because it might be harmful for them you can you can, because you need to use sky list uh, sky lifts and there are all these registrations so there is a lot of different uh, shall we call it conditions and negotiation with the uh, shall we call it ideology uh, material uh, um, political human as well as more than human um, yeah processes uh, at stake involving this whole whole process but very often as artists when we talk about okay um i i, I want to give the climate crisis a, a, a sound a sonic experience now we don't talk about these processes behind uh maybe for good reasons because the people wants to people you, we need to frame them in a certain way because people want be, because people wants to uh, to hear the agency of or to, to hear the melting ice or whatever but there is a lot of shall we call it um, tacit knowledge or hidden knowledge here at stake which which we very often not even mention in the final result so that is something that I've been uh, found, found extremely important to to put focus on and of course, all these ne negotiations with what we can do and what we cannot do highly affect the outcome of the work uh, in the end. This is just a, another uh, uh, slide which shows uh, also the currents uh, where we were in the morning. It seems to be very early, early uh, tourists there. Uh, but the opera is still still closed, and uh, of course it or of course ob it, unfortunately the sky lift was not uh, high enough. So uh, the planned uh, positioning of the uh, installment of the loudspeakers needed to be totally rearranged uh, in in the end of the process, which of course affects the the experience of the work when it comes to spatial uh, experiences and things like that. That's just a, today I focus very much about loud loudspeakers and. Uh, um, loudspeaker cables, but they they are they are just examples of parts of the process. So it's not that I'm just uh, specialized in installing loudspeaker cables. But this is basically a little kind of a map of of if you look at the currents as 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 a kind of a, um, assemblage, if we take that use that term. So coming, what what are they? What are the agencies actually involved in this work? Well, we have the global warming, we have the Arctic, we have the Gulf Stream, we have the transatlantic uh, telecom cable, we have the Faroe Telecom, uh, the telecom station of the Faroe Islands, uh, we have the Department of Meteorology at Stockholm University, we have another person who helps me to analyze it, make analysis and and um, interpretation of data in real time, a programmer that I'm working very closely with and of course has an enormous impact on the final outcome. We have the technical development, um, uh, that, that, that's more like the, shall we call it, hardware, uh, but then we we'll also have the Oslo Opera House in itself, uh, visitors, social activities and interactions, uh, the restaurant, we have, uh, we're talking about the legal owner of the Oslo, what you're allowed to do and not, we have founding, I mean, this becomes very schizo schizophrenic in the, uh, in the end, it's totally open because it never ends actually. And of course, you have to kind of put put a, put an end to it and make a decision. What shall I how what shall I mention and and what shall I not mention? But but I I, I think these are very crucial parts of the artistic process. And in the beginning, I, I referred to this uh, uh, the, these uh, open call for for call for work for this soft uh, sound design installation. This is precisely what many commissioners have no clue about. Uh, or art commissioners in in general, uh, but it plays. It has an enormous impact on our artistic, um, shall we call it, uh, practice. Yeah. Um, 
I was actually thinking about going to another project now, which also has with the sound and see to do, but maybe this might be a very good moment if there are questions so far, because we're in the middle of two, two project. I don't know what you say, Annie. Sure, we can see. I mean, there's been a question in the chat about the sonification handbook that you mentioned. Yeah, I promise to, I can send it to you immediately after it, even though I heavily, heavily, yeah, what, what is the question about, by the way? <laughs> because I, think, I don't see it at the moment when I... Oh, when I think I, just people were interested to check out the book you mentioned. Okay, yeah. okay. I will definitely give you a link to, to it, having in mind about the criti critique of representation. But it's very, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a very, uh, yeah, um, qu uh, shall we call it, serious attempt to, to give a broader perspective on, on sonification. Mm -hmm. So I will definitely do that. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else about anything so far? If not, we can save the questions until the end. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so having in mind, uh, we'll talk about, again, about uh, uh, thinking about working with environment or thinking about uh, site specificity uh, in relation to the to the ocean or, or bigger global phenomena. Um, I would like to share another work with you or another process um, called Mare Balticum from 2015, Mare Balticum or the Baltic. Um, um, uh, so it's basically, I was basically had the possibility to join in. It's the EU, was an EU funded uh, research, pro uh, scientific uh, research project that basically wanted to um, basically wanted to um, measure the sound levels in the Baltic Sea um, because at the moment there is a, a, an enormous enormous uh, increase of vessels in the in the Baltic Sea so uh, I think that there are around 2,000 vessels uh, per day trafficking tra uh, trafficking the the Baltic Sea my, one might my, I, sometimes I feel I so dumb so I don't even uh, okay is 2,000 much or not I don't have an idea honestly uh, but but so it's it was basically Basically, uh, um, the scientific project gathered uh, researchers from six different uh, Baltic nations, spanning from Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Poland, um, Denmark, and Germany. I, I think that was six nations, right? <laughs> uh, basically, to make a synchronized synchronized action where they were basically uh, measuring the sound levels synchronized in the Baltic for one year. Uh, and what you see here is basically an autostrada. Uh, it's it's a, a slide from 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 the Helcom Commission's um, outcome of, of of vessel traffic. So this is basically a map of of the of the uh, traffic vessel traffic or ship. Do you call it ship traffic in in the uh, in in the Baltic? It really looks like a a, a autobahn. I would say uh, what you say autobahn high, highway. Is that what you call it? <laughs> um, I'm going to show you, it will also take around a few minutes. Stop, the sound starts a little bit later.
Okay, um, I, I was thinking about before we continue, maybe this is a perfect moment to take five, ten minutes break. What would you say, Annie? Would this be okay? I think it's a perfect moment to take a break. Yeah, great idea. Um, is five minutes enough or do you want to take a bit longer? How about you, Osa? Uh, f five minutes is ab absolutely okay from my perspective. Okay, let's take five minutes and then if we have time after you finish, we can have a couple of minutes before the Q&A or something. Okay, so let's okay. meet back at um, UK time 3.31. See you all. Okay, so maybe <clears throat> we can make a slow start. We've had one question in from Fraser. Would you like to take it now? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just read it out as mm -hmm. you may, may not be able to see it. So Fraser says, I find the interconnectivity of these works really astounding, weaving a complexly realized web from and around ideas. As you mentioned, these can connect to the unforeseen. Do, do you find this impacts or shapes the final pieces or influenced other projects? Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, I think that's the, that's the that is the straight straight answer. Yes, they absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Fraser. We can come back to that also uh, after after. But th thanks for 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 the comment. A really really crucial comment, I would say. So thank you very much, and for the question as well. <laughs> oh, we've also had one more from Tom. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you worked with the BIAS, B-I-A-S, and were able to use their recordings. That's why I thought it's good to take a break before we go into that those details, because that's exactly what I thought about thought of, of talking about right now. So yes, I did. Um, and um, let's have a look if it's working. Oh no, we don't need that again. So um, this is a kind of a little retake. So uh, 38 uh, points or. 38 places uh, uh, with 38 hydrophones deployed over one year. And because of the fact, so you might wonder how can you synchronize them because they had internal timers and I don't know if there was, what do you call it, at atom uh, time, atom, or whatever you call it in in, in Germany. And they put nuclear clocks, or they? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Exactly. I, I don't really know. But but for some reason, they managed to, to do this mapping very, time mapping very properly or synchroni synchronization, because that is, of course, the, the crucial thing for this this work on the one hand. And on the, one, uh, on the other hand, the big, the, the, the big scale perspective. Um, yeah, this is basically what they managed to to, um, to to find out. But for those who are very interested in the noise levels of the Baltic, I refer to there is a website of the BIAS project. But so, what was actually my, my how did I how how was I involved? Well, I basically know one of the members and realized that most of the most of of, of acoust acousticians or whatever you call it, people working with underwater acoustics, they. They don't listen to this. They don't use the the sound sound files, right? Uh, they may they use them in terms of uh, uh, statistics, or they they make visual maps. But no one basically got an opportunity to to experience the sound. So that was basically my my task when we applied for this uh, EU uh, EU funding. Um, because normally, when you when you apply for these kind of big scale EU uh, commissions, you, you maybe you've been driving on a highway and, and then you see a little uh, a little placard or whatever it's called uh, information that this was supported by the EU Commission, but you you can't do that with the whole uh, ocean, right? Uh, because you can't put up uh, information sheets around the whole ocean, so. Then we came up with the idea. So let's let's make the artist do it and invite an artist or me, as I know a few of the people to, to do something. So it's really thinking about the the potential of the technology or or the the material. Uh, basically, uh, loads or terabytes of data that that no one ever listened to. 
And uh, I mean, that was my, my, my intention to, to kind of how can you translate this or I wouldn't call it translation. I, it's about the transformation process, uh, transversal uh, transformation process uh, where, where, where I try to kind of connect to where, where you look at these data as traces of uh, specific moments uh, in time and space. Uh, and I scaled down, so I picked uh, picked out. Uh, I think it was twelve of these uh, thirty eight spots in order to make it more more, shall we call it, accessible for for myself. And um, I mean, I had to make my own little register. So each of these columns basically uh, represents one place at a certain moment. And I, I went through uh, the material and tried to make my own archive of what I was actually listened to. So twelve places, twelve months uh, and in order to to um, scale it down even more I also picked out two days every month uh, and 15 minutes uh, every hour so it's really kind of scaling down but nevertheless you get you get spots of time time synchronized uh, time so all in all I listened through around 1728 hours of, of recordings just to get an idea what 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 what's actually there, um, and I know I sometimes got the uh, question, but why do you care? Why didn't you use the material just as it is? But well, honestly, I'm not the conceptual artist because I like it because I'm interested in the perceptual uh, sens sensorial outcome. So for me, it's super important to to have an idea of 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 of, of the the sound material. So basically, and these are the same spots uh, another month. Uh, so I don't know, I think yellow represents vessel traffic, uh, green, I think it was something like uh, noise or something, white noise, which is basically caused by by uh, uh, bad weather or storms. But mainly all this yellow and orange and, and, and red uh, um, colorings or representations uh, basically uh, represent the, uh, sound traffic or the uh, traffic human induced sound. So there was really a, a lot of, of, of traffic, even though when, when I was listening. I mean, this is not, this is really just so you get a glimpse of my, my own personal process. Um, because I'm not a scientist and I didn't have any kind of idea of making a scientific coherent work. It's a way of ordering and categorizing uh, an enormous material. So, yeah, I think you can listen. This is how our one original sound look like, sounds like. So the question is, of course, what do you do with the material and how uh, should you play it as it is? Because, I mean, this is a very important part of what, what you could call the artistic mapping process or the process of transformation. I work very much uh, uh, in super collider. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that. Some of you might be. It's a it's a it's a code based uh, uh, aleatoric program. It can be a sound synthesis program. Uh, uh, where I very often work with uh, like r resonators, so basically working with the material. So sometimes the, the these sounds are totally unfiltered, and sometimes you you make very very uh, narrow fil filterings. So it sounds like should we call it colored? That's what what you can refer to. And there was actually a very, uh, very, very, very pragmatic reason to that because uh, the less uh, um, less uh, filter the material is, the harder it is to distinguish the different places. Uh, so it basically I filtered each of these. Um, I mean, um, each of these. Uh, places have their specific position in in the tunnel so uh, it's easier if one this place has one specific cr frequency filtering and this one has another one because it's perceptually much easier to dis distinguish them so so i mean this and this is of course the really uh, Handwerk or the, the the kind of design uh, knowledge or whatever you should call. Um, for me, as a Swede, design has a little bit. Uh, um, I would call it a negative um, uh, connotation. Uh, I would call it gestaltungs or, or gestaltnings pr process, where the, the artistic process, so to say, speak, because it's more than mere designing. There is a lot of uh, artistic uh, uh, things to take into consideration. And there's also, of course, uh, uh, 100 and 
57 meter long tunnel uh, with its specific uh, uh, reverb, all those kind of issues, which is also involved in, in, in the process. Um, yeah, um, I think that there's a lot of things that can be said about this work as well. Um, but I thought that I should just conclude with a few projects that I, uh, a project that I'm doing right now, which is, has with my um, um, international postdoc project to do, which very, very closely addresses the issues that I kind of outlined today, which has with documentary practices as, as sonification and, and uh, um, um, underwater technology and, and, and those kind of record, uh, recording technologies and their, their agency. So um, um, I, I, I actually started two months last year. It, it should run from 2020 to 2022, but due to Corona, we all know what works. I'm not going to spend half an hour to complain about that, but I had to postpone the project more or less. So it's basically a, a study on, on, on where, where I'm interested to develop uh, uh, these projects into to a kind of investigation of the potential of, of sound um, and, and also the um, kind of a critical investigation of the agency of, of uh, acoustic underwater technologies and what happens when these this data this documentary very often not not used data is transformed into an artistic context i also already showed you two two pieces so you might already got some uh, kind of uh, idea um so it's basically um in what way in what way does the the sound and sonic technologies actually establish the perception we have on the arctic and, and, and all these kind of things that, that's embedded in, 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 in um, documentary practices. Um, I'm just going to see. So basically, yeah, a working title, Transforming Anthropocene into an Artistic Experience, which basically is, the, is just what I've been doing already in, in the, these previous works. But, but it's also about how sound really can mediate information of global relevance about the Arctic or how this information can be transformed to an embodied sonic experience. So it's really a continuation of the practice that I've been working on for 10 years. Um, and I'm currently so basically work following three scientific teams work in the Arctic uh, glaciologists. I think that is what you call right. Uh, people who are <laughs> discovering or, or doing research on glacier. Glacier, do you call it ice shields? Ice, what, what do you call it? Do you say glaciology? Yeah, the, yeah, okay, perfect. So basically to look at uh, uh, what they're doing. And I mean, this is one of the part of the project takes place in the north of Sweden. Uh, in the uh, yeah south part of the Arctic, and one of the projects takes place up here, where I actually I came home from from an expedition last week from the north of Svalbard. Um, and I don't know if you agree with me, but this is very often the way where you where you um, getting information about what's happening right now through visuals, from visual representation of, of what's hap happening with the Arctic sea ice or, or, or glacier, glaciers as well. Uh, this is a picture from 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 NASA and you can have a look at it. Uh, I, yeah, from the International Institute of Climate Action and Theory, uh, but Basically, uh, um, apparently there, uh, actually, I would say, uh, there is a lot of, uh, th th there is a lot of investigations or a lot of material about the Arctic are actually gained by um, uh, uh, acoustic technologies, but we don't, but people don't take that so, so much into consideration. And that also, uh, when I, I previously, uh, with Mare Balticum, I show you that uh, what the scientists, they create uh, uh, statistic, but also visual maps. You can look at the, uh, 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 the noise levels in the Arctic Ocean. No, sorry, sorry, in the in the Baltic. And it's the same here that there are actually scientists who are doing so-called bathymetry, where you where you're using echolocalization technologies, where you actually uh, are mapping the seabed, but also uh, also uh, glaciers and like sea uh, sea bottoms in order to look at uh, um, changes of, of uh, related to the global uh, warming warming crisis. I think it's called so. 
I've been spe I'm specifically interested in so-called passive and active sonars. Um, passive sonars, that's basically hydrophones, underwater microphones. Um, and um, active sonars uh, is basically uh, echolocalization technology uh, where it, very often at these scientific vessels uh, where, where you go out and do the measurements, you have a huge uh, transducers and sound beamers, um, uh, what do you call it, applied to, this, uh, to the bottom. Sorry, I'm very bad at prep prepositions, but I hope you get it. So you basically have uh, sound beamers attached to the bottom of the vessel where, where, you, where, you, uh, where you basically send out sound. It's like when you when you listen to uh, like Second World uh, War uh, movies. Uh, honestly, I don't do it very often, but you can hear this ping. It's when the submarines are looking for enemies, and that is basically what these ships are doing. They are sending out a sound signal, and then they record the the uh, the um, uh, the e echoes or the uh, uh, what do you call it reverberation uh, uh, that comes back, and from that you can make very very. Um, advanced uh, visual, visual, visualizations of the seabed. So, so that is what I am actually looking into right now, because these are kind of equipment that you normally, as an artist, you it's really hard to get get in touch of it. Uh, you, you can, of course, you can create your own technology, but I I think that there is a really a lack of infrastructures where science and art can meet. Uh, basically, where where artists can get get use of these kind of technologies. So that is also part of my my research project to see if this can somehow how, how you can establish those those platforms. Um, yeah, and this is are just a few glimpses from from one of the first uh, expeditions uh, was made in the Sulitelma glacier in Sweden last summer, where I was uh, joining a scientist or glaciologist Nina Kirchner from the Polin Center for Climate Research in Stockholm University. And you can see the look at this as in the beginning, I, I talked about uh, site specific mapping as an affective process. Uh, uh, an interrelational process with the site and this is actually what I've been uh, interesting of doing when I joined in with, with, with Nina and her research. Um, I'm not a social anthropologist so uh, I think it's super important to state that uh, everyone in the team know that I'm an artist. I'm going to use this data. I'm going to look at how people are working, but I'm also interacting and helping the team, being part of the team. So basically looking at what technologies they are working at there. You can see the glacier up here um, and, and look, looking at the, the conditions for gaining this data. So it's not very much about them as persons, but because we have a very, uh, shall we call it, uh, often you have an idea that science is a very linear process, or uh, uh, but it's basically also based on randomness, such as uh, occasional um, um, things that happen, such as a storm uh, that simply may, may forces you as a scientist to change your plan, which heavily affects the outcome of, of your or your research project. So uh, these are just some 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 glimpses from 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 that process. And I'm, I'm still in the beginning of this uh, postdoctoral uh, project. So I, I shouldn't say so much about it until I had the time to really think about to think about it in a more ser serious terms. But I, I thought it'd be interesting for you to that I share a few uh, share a few of these uh, uh, th these pictures as well. How do you get? How do you get electricity? How does that impact on what you can do, what you cannot do, and of course the technologies you are using. Um, this is basically a camera, a uh, new time lapse camera that are taking photos of the glacier to see if you can see uh, any uh, signs of calming, that is that the glacier is mel melting. And at the same time, uh, she, she, she is right now experimenting with uh, underwater uh, technology or hydrophones to see, to see, that's a bit funny, a bit, <laughs> but to see if you can actually hear what you cannot see. Um, and that comes back to the my first uh, uh, my first little uh, snip uh, little uh, clip. This is basically uh, a recording, a sound recording 
taken in synchronization with a um, visual underwater recording of the same of the glacier glacier and it i think it's very in a very very interesting way highlights uh, what you really can't see you sometime can hear so what you hear is the moment of of cracking a few few you can hear a calving if you know that this happens but you can absolutely not see it I think this is in a very clear way. I, I don't use this as a kind of pr proof material or so, but it, it, I think it in a very beautiful way or poetic way materializes the fact that we we live in a very visual uh, um, society where we always look at things. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of things embedded in the potential of the sonic. And that's what, what, what I've been trying to, to kind of, yeah. Uh, discuss and present today, which connects to my, my practice and my perspective. And I, I think that is it from my perspective. So I'm going to stop share the screen now. So thank you so much, Asa. That was fantastic. And so beautiful the pieces and thanks for sharing them with us and explaining them. Um, probably more questions uh, to come. Um, are people okay to go straight into the Q&A? Does anyone need a minute break or two minutes break? Mm -hmm. We take one minute just for everyone to kind of stretch and clear their throat and stuff and then we will start with the Q&A. Okay, see you all back here in just over one minute. See you in a moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think we have a small team this week of Q and A um, students who prepared a few questions. So Callie. I'm gonna make you oh no, actually, Michael, could you please make Callie Spence um a co-host and i think it was rosie spence uh i don't know if rosie's actually here and fifth crap i'm not sure if fifth crap's here i think i think callie is going to lead the questions is that right callie yes sure hello hello Can you go thank ahead? you very much yeah sure should, should i begin yeah thank you very much for your lecture it was really inspiring yeah thank you um, I'll just um, just jump right into it then and um, ask some questions if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got some, You're um, welcome. Yeah, we've got some questions on the, the Padlet board, which um, from the students, which I'll um, I'll ask you first. I'll just copy and paste them into the chat as well as read them, so hmm? you can um, you can see them. So this first question is from Kai. It says, um, in my interpretation of some of your work, it seems you um, give um, representation to usually unheard elements of the places we inhabit be it in an area like Hamburg or Sabakwa or the entire country of Sweden in Earthsong. Where does the impetus for this approach come from for you? Well, if I only know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's a very, very existential, or for not saying ontological question. I have no idea, actually, to be honest. I only know that I've always been interested in, 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 uh, in listening to the environment um, I remember as a child, I was playing, I would trade a little bit in classical piano and I always liked to open the window to let uh, let the sounds from the piano interfere with the, with the, with the traffic noises. Uh, and I, I, I wish I had a very, very clear response to you, but I don't, I don't actually. But I think that there is 
some kind of ecosophical approach to emphasize interconnectedness, uh, interconnectedness, and 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 the idea that we 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 are never detached. We are always connected, and and I think that sound is a very very interesting. Should we call it method, approach, uh, uh, way of living, way of of of, of working, um, a media basically, because it has its um, spatial temporal capacity. It has a very, 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 um, yeah, effective way of establishing spaces. Uh, but it's also very, I mean, both per- very perceptual uh, in the sense that you can create a very yeah, uh, perceptual experience, and and it's also discursive, or shall we call it informative? It has, it means something. It can send a message. So there's a lot of different layerings here that that made me interested working with sound to to emphasize uh, interconnected interconnectedness. I think it's called. <laughs> You can, you're absolutely free to help me with the terms if you understand. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I'll hand it over to, to Rosie for the next question. Thanks for the thanks for a very good question, by the way. That's all right. It's, um, it was from from Kai, I think. Yeah. So um, I don't know if Rosie wants oh, to come yeah, on. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> thanks right. again um, for the lecture. It was really great. I felt really inspired by it as well. Um, so the next question we have. Uh, Callie, are you right to paste it in the chat whilst I read it? Yeah, of course. Um, Um, Okay, it's from Anonymous, but it says, on your website, you say that you're interested in art making a difference in the era of advanced capitalism. What's your opinion on how a lot of art exhibitions and installations are sponsored and funded by large companies, conglomerates and banks? That's something I, I I think it's I mean we I think that that's something that uh, specifically if we come from music that you've been very if you think of, yeah thinking in, again in terms of the more modernistic approach that you separate the you separate the artist subject you separate the uh, all the kind this kind of stories behind or the 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 uh, shall we call it. Um, yeah, everything that is not the the work itself, but of course we have to take that into consideration, and I think that will more and more transform uh, art actually um, in in both how it is materialized, but of course also from where do, for instance, the, the technology come from, which. This is actually something I'm specifically interested in when it comes to this uh, this postdoctoral project because uh, most of the uh, most of these technologies come from from Kongsberg, which is basically the fa- uh, weapon um, military factories of, of 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 Norway. So of course we we you you can't just think that is not not necessary because it it has a, its agency as well. Um, but you could also thinking about what happens if you put yourself outside of all this. Uh, w- w- there is always a limit when when you want to be you want to be part of the game. You want to be you want to express yourself and you want to say something. Um, so it's always a fine line, I think. And I think it's not really for me at least. It's not important to generalize this and say no. I I think about this when it comes to technology. I think about this. It, it's very much from project to project. It's it's very site specific or, or situated as well. Yeah, great, thank you. And I'll hand back over to Callie for the next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's uh, one that's just come into the chat, which I'll read out, which is, mm-hmm. um, how do you approach um, permanent sound installations? In comparison to temporary ones that won't be available for as long, what differs in the process? Honestly, uh, if there is a if an art installation runs or a sound installation runs a week, I would say that the process, uh, the very technical and artistic process, is almost the same. But of course, the the kind of all these kind of negotiations when it comes to commissioners and all the kind of these kind of of, of things differs highly. Um, but it can be a long term process anyway. Um, but I I would say that. The biggest difference might also be that what you can express if you make a uh, t- uh, permanent installation and what you what you might not, not be able to do or what you might be able to do if uh, the commissioner knows that it's just going to run for, for a short time. 
So um, yeah, that might also change actually. And it differs, I mean. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Rosie, do you want to ask the next one? Yeah, um, this one's from Thomas and it says, why did you choose sound as a medium to present the issues of the Anthropocene? Well, I would definitely, I would respond and say, why not? <laughs> I actually had a professor once who, who, who asked this very often, why do you do this? So, so sometimes maybe you don't, I, I think I maybe also responded to this previously when I said that I found sound as a very, very interesting medium to work with because it has so many many options or opportunities uh, so it has a lot of potential to create a kind of a, yeah immersed or perceptual experience of, of phenomenon that are so so complex and so so big scale so they are merely only not accessible even though we are of course infused by them uh, from from different angles every day from from we can see that the snow tends to be rain nowadays, at least in Sweden in the winter and so on. But, but a, a sound as a medium to where you can actually um, make perceivable these issues. I don't know if this was a good response, but at least a try. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that you don't really realize how much of an impact sound has on like everyone until you really think about it. Uh, Callie, do you want to do the, I think we've just had another one coming. Yeah, through. we just had a couple in the chat. Um, uh, so this is from Osha. It says, uh, as you said, we live in a visual world. Do you think um, that sound can transform the way people are perceiving environmental and other issues? Do you think the connection through the sound is more intimate and reaches, the, reaches deeper than the visual medium? Um, I I think I've been working so long with the medium of sound so uh, for such a long time. So I would say it can do, it has the capacity, it has the potential. Uh, if we if we can uh, avoid, uh, uh, shall we call it, uh, mere representation. If we have the capacity to to continue to work with sound as an experimental medium, I would say to not fulfill our idea about how that should sound. Uh, in that sense, I think yes, and I think it definitely has a very intimate um, uh, opportunity to reach deep because, uh, I mean, in these now you listen to these uh, as really shitty, uh, th these documentaries, and it's really shitty because they are like 22 channel installation, one is a 22 channel installation and the other is also a multi, multi channel installation. And I often work with tactile sounds, so sounds is not only what you hear, from like from a stereo uh, like left to right uh, but it is uh, an, an embodied uh, experience a vibrational experience actually yeah yeah definitely when I was listening to a few of your pieces before the lecture they're all very um like textural as yeah well. I think they are yeah 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 um Rosie do you want to go on to the next one yeah just on that texture point if I can squeeze in do you get like do you find that the surroundings like around you when you're recording it affects what texture you would put into the piece well i can highly um admit that i think i the absolutely baddest and word, uh, worst sound recordist in the world and that's maybe why i work with sonification and work with others uh, data uh, or or sound recordings uh so so that's that. That is my like secret truth, uh, hidden truth. Don't, don't tell anyone. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, besides joking, um, I think that it comes very much after. Sometimes, of course, I'm working with with sound sound recordings as well. And I think it's more more when listening through it afterwards uh, that I found uh, what, what can yeah the the nuances of textures and 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 all these kind of kind of things. So maybe not in the very act of uh, recording. I'm not, I'm not sure if this was a response to your question. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thanks. And I'll just read Derek's one as well in the chat. Um, what role do you think sound artists have or can take when working along science to help towards global issues? Um, yeah, what I think that's something I, I struggle a lot with. Can scientists and artists really work together? Because even though I've been working a lot using uh, scientific material, I'm not, I'm not sure I can 
I can learn scientists. This sounds. This is super generalized now. It's like there's how many million scientists do we scientific scientists do we have out there? But I got the feeling that that maybe uh, there can be at least a, some kind of acceptance, and I think that there is often a curiosity uh, when they realize that they're very, shall we call it, uh, dry. Scientific material can be approached from a from a different angle. Uh, but I never, I never felt the like idea of teaching so- sound, uh, sorry, uh, scientists uh, my way of working or, or anything like that. I think that m- m- I also said that previous in this presentation that what I feel there is a lack of infrastructure for uh, when when uh, technological infrastructure where uh, scientists and artists can share technology. Um, uh, I mean, thinking in terms of the bias project, uh, the, this, these are kind of infrastructures that we normally never, never get our hands on. And for many people, you're not interested at all because you want to create your own uh, handmade uh, hydrophone and absolutely fine with that too, because that's another big story uh, and important issue related to, to, to what, what kind of approach and also related to the agency of technology. But I think that that should at least be the option. Um, because how, we, always, you, we always talk about that uh, art has there's a lack of lack of money etc etc et but of course because uh, i mean what would happen if we got uh, the opportunity to use the same kind of infrastructures i think that will create absolutely interesting synergies between science and and art yeah yeah great um Kali, do you want to do one from lara uh, from lara yes sure um I was pleased that you mentioned the criticality of sonification. Do you think this has any suggestions? Do you think you have any suggestions for further reading on this? Have you written more on this yourself? Well, well I wrote a chapter on it in, in my PhD, and I can, uh, after this presentation, I can send you the uh, sonification handbook if you didn't f- already find it. There is a yes, link. You can, yeah, you can just download it, and you can download the, my, P, my dissertation as well. So you can have both of them. Yeah, I, I also wanted to ask, because uh, mine was quite related to Derek's question, which is, um, h- how might you suggest as artists we can work towards a more sustainable practice? That's the question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, how can, how can we do that? I mean, recycle, for sure. Um, I think that there will be much more pressure in the future about uh, how, uh, I mean, also Today, I mean, how much uh, electricity does need to run a permanent installation? I think all these things will be much more, more critically, um, shall we say, it's now it's taken for granted, no one cares. But I think uh, in that sense, yeah, maybe we should refuse to use fossil, uh, fossil, what do you call it, um, oils or whatever you call it. Yeah, fossil fuels. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's all right. That's just a very tiny, but then of course you can share, share, share. I think it's about uh, thinking about sharing things because mm. everyone has a interface at home today, right? Uh, yeah. Sit there yeah. on your own. But I, I think it's, it's very complicated because uh, I don't want to say that everything, everyone should work collective uh, because this also kind of, uh, there is something moral, m- there's a morality or a moral approach to that, which I think I would like to avoid. Some people needs to work uh, very, very individual in order to express their take on on life. So, so, but that these are a few suggestions at least. Yeah, thank you. Um, Rosie, do, do you want to read out um, Angus's question? Yeah. Um, so this one is from Angus. It's, I was wondering what kind of listening communities emerge through your work. Do other people interact with one another or what trends do you notice when more than one person is listening to a work? Oh, that's very, um, that's interesting. Um, I never even thought about that. Uh, thank you for it. That's really interesting. I think people always, uh, we are collective social beings, right? So of, I guess that, I think this, uh, I'm, I made a work that's also based on sonification, on seismographic data that I exhibited uh, in, 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 in a in, uh, festival this summer, uh, so it's basically circular c- circle for wooden panels, and below them you have you have the loudspeaker or transducers attached, and I think that 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 was very clearly showed that 
people, there were some people coming in and they sat down on these wooden panels or whatever you call it. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and it you, you, for a longer period. And then when new audience came in or new people came in, they, of course, experienced that something was going on. So they were highly affected by the social uh, act of listening in this work, I would say. I think that was the most obvious is the most obvious example how 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 um, a work one of my work can evoke a kind of collective act of listening. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was really great. Yeah, I think we're kind of we're we're at the end of our uh, questions. The the pre the the um questions that are written before the um the session. But if um anyone else on the um. The chat wants to add any other questions for for also that'd be great I, I, yeah i really want to thank you for these very valuable and important questions i'm very very impressed by the questions i have to say <laughs> that's all right <laughs> it's very encouraging for me to to get them because i you know you take things for granted in your own practice and then they these these uh these questions are really ear opener eye opener mm. as well <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Kali and Rosie, for sharing right. and reading those out. Um, I think I missed um, a comment before from Alicia. I think, Alicia, you were asking if the installation, um, the one in the tunnel, is that Mara Balticum, um, was still open? Is it? Was that one a permanent one? Is that one that... That's a temporary, that was a temporary installation. Temporary. Yeah, so it was unfortunately not, no. Okay, sorry, Alicia. You can't visit that the next time <laughs> you're in the area. <laughs> um, great. Anyone else got any more questions? So the other students or our guests are also very welcome to ask also anything. Um, Lara has asked, maybe a little help to become a more sustainable artist can make use of words and language and their performativity writing in practice so you mean thinking about language and, and writing in terms of sustainability Lara don't worry <laughs> okay okay great thinking through um yeah language and sustainability there's also vulnerable languages aren't there there's languages that are kind of threatened with extinction absolutely absolutely um yeah i think that we what i i'm interested to um what do you refer to when you talk about languages it's a question back to you lara i think <laughs> yeah i think so too <laughs> can, can i unmute then oh I yes mean? please go ahead um I'm thinking that, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to make a work, how to listen to all these experiences in this effective encounter with a work. Um, and often a lot of, well, many artists I have met over the years, um, language is, is quite threatening to us as, as the written word or, or words or the spoken or listened to. And I think it could be a really um, interesting way to consider how work can be made in that way that is about sound and listening and 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 the multiplicity of languages that are, that are around and so many people end up being forced to write about work in a language that isn't their first or second language even absolutely absolutely but i think that these i am as a swede i'm i'm very used to the fact that i mean i all i always i i I'm perfectly fluent in speaking Swinglish, and I know that I have a shitty English, and that's just that's just the way it is. And uh, either you can take the you can take do the make the decision because in Swedish uh, people know me as I have a very shall we call it virtuos, uh, uh, very very beautiful language, and I know that it sounds very different when I speak English. But but nevertheless, if you have something to say, just accept it. I, I think this was probably not the question you were posing now. So I, I'm not sure I, I really got it. It's not a straightforward question. I think your yeah. answer and, and in your presentation, I was really aware that you are you are thinking you are translating. And, and there's all these things that that that, f you know, f filter away or just um, don't always get through, but other things get through. 
Ah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. definitely. Absol and, absolutely. And sound is, is like that, right? So when we are thinking as artists who, who work with sound and listening, if we learn to learn is a terrible word, but if we uh, 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 encourage it more, like you said very early on, words are performative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, absolutely. But I think that is also, I mean, the, the, I, I, I'm not sure this anyway is a direct response to your, your, your comment, but I think it also puts focus on the relation between theory and practice, which always is a very dangerous, <laughs> danger, dangerous t subject to end up in because it's such a huge, huge uh, uh, field, uh, not least in artistic, one of the big central issues in artistic uh, uh, research, uh, uh, arti yeah, artistic research. Um, and I think that there are, uh, there are many ways of, you're talking about language or may, uh, understanding understanding uh, the, the performative uh, aspects of, of language in, in, in artistic research. And I mean, I myself, I like to write and I like philosophy. Uh, and from my perspective, I, I, I didn't mind to write a kind of quite uh, theoretically dense uh, comment or, or, or inquiry or investigation of my, my practice. But I think that we thinking in terms of, of language as something that is uh, performative and always productive. It's never about representation. It's always affective. It always uh, creates something. So I think it's, uh, I mean, the uh, my my ambition with the with before sound uh, PhD project was was actually to trans to transform our way of thinking slash pra practicing pra slash uh, performing art. So in that sense, I think uh, a language and, and 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 the act of doing is is inseparable. But this is another. This is really not not maybe 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 respond to your 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 thought. Thanks, Laura. Did you want to add anything more? Um, maybe just briefly. It, 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 it's, it's all very, very amazing. But I, I think that as artists, we, we, we must be before the theory in a way. Sometimes the theory is very useful, but if we're responding to it all the time, we're not in... I, for me, I think the art starts to get absorbed and submerged and is always in response to that. And I'm really interested in people who will be able to make work that is of 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 them and from from somewhere that is is i don't know the word not 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 leading but yeah some i don't know but yeah i think i understand i understand perfectly what you mean of course if you apply theory on art it's absolutely uninteresting or or, or i mean yeah i think that's a very uh, if i guess that this is what you you mean right yeah, exactly. But yeah, but thank you. Enjoy today a lot. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lara. Um, okay, a couple more questions have come in, so I'll just read those ones out. So Joseph says, um, it sounds like you're influenced by some critical thinkers. Oh, it's a bit similar, I guess, <laughs> to Lara's point. Do you see yourself in a way as a kind of translator of these ideas into something that is more conceivable to those who experience your work? So again, on this question of, I guess, philosophy, um, theory into your practice. I would say that I am highly affected, uh, highly, but I'm affected of, on, on some of these theories. And they, of course, uh, affect the way that I'm uh, practicing art in somehow. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I made one name dropping, I think, Deleuze and Guattari here, but I prefer to not not do this as a kind of philosophical presentation. But uh, I mean, I, I think that ecosophy is quite interesting. Uh, I also think some of, of, of uh, Rancière's idea on the political rela related to, to perception is interesting. But I, I think it's, for me, it's more like, uh, just as you said, was it Laura? I, I really don't remember the names anymore. But, but Laura. Yeah, yeah. The, the exp my, I mean, all the thinkers or, or the, 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 the people who are practicing with words, I would prefer to call it. I think from my perspective, uh, the way why I can address uh, Ecosophy or, or Deleuze and Guattari, some of their ideas, because I mean, it's a huge uh, things which ha it's a critique of the like the whole philosophical traditions with which I might not interested in uh, when I address them. It, it's more because they speak to me. 
because I can relate to, to relate to them and they help me to to make my practice um, verbally accessible, I would say. So it's not about applying something. It's just as you say, the practice comes first and then you realize there are thinkers or thinker practici practitioners that that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's your uh, philosophical friends, I would say, in that sense. Yeah, thanks for, I guess, clarifying your relationship to the ideas that accompany you um, in, your, in your artistic process. Um, okay, Tom has a question. Um, I was wondering in regards to the transformative ability of a sound project, do you think about the presentation of the work and who it may affect, whether it's a general public or a specific group of people? Absolutely. I think that's a very, for me at least, it's a, when thinking about, again, thinking about site specific work as an engagement and, and uh, establishing a relation with the interrelational agencies or, or, or aspects of that of a specific site of course humans the people people being there and some people or who, who are who are the people who used to visit this specific place as I very often develop things outside the so-called white box so I think that is a uh, has a very very uh, highly yeah it's very crucial for me who is who am I addressing this um, but it doesn't mean that I I, I don't choose uh, sometimes uh, yeah specific strategies that might feel uncomfortable. Uh, for instance, the work Mare Balticum in the tunnel, you might find it that it's uh, a bit smooth and so on, but it's uh, sometimes uh, almost on the uh, limits of, of uh, that it make, fe feels uncomfortable because it's very uh, loud sometimes. But of course, yeah, or it, I shouldn't say of course, but uh, yes, I do absolutely think about the, the presentation of the work and who it may affect. Brilliant, thank you. Anyone else has questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or you can put up your hand um, and come on the microphone. I've got a question, if I may, if there's no one else urgently. Um, I think Lara also touched on this before, but I wondered if you could speak a bit more about your criticisms of sonification. So I think some people here may be a bit familiar with sonification. Maybe some people are hearing about it for the first time today. Um, but my understanding is that it's more a, a field kind of driven by data scientists. Um, and not some, I mean, it's, so it's like a, a method maybe that some artists use or or sound artists in particular use and I was wondering if you if you could elaborate a bit on your criticisms and whether they are towards the the field as such or whether they are about the artistic uses of sonification no I wouldn't say it's a, it's it's about the uh, um, artistic artistic uses of sonification because I think I mean there are as many ways of using sonification as an artistic m method as there are people right so it's more like about what we what we very often cut uh, what we cut away uh, and the complexity uh, shall we call it the messiness the dirt the dirty practice behind uh, the the practice of sonification uh, the complexity that things are not are never straightforward representations and I think this goes uh, as much this this addresses as much uh, uh, field recording if you're thinking about that as representing reality so in that sense it's generally a, a, a criticism about uh, um, thinking about that there is a kind of essen essentialistic uh, idea of truth uh, a per perfect mo uh, perfect um yeah um condition of translate translation that and this is what people all, all, all often do uh, yeah addresses and that is what i criticize mm. yeah, I think, okay. mm, yeah no go on yeah because i think that the complexity is what makes our uh, our works interesting actually and we should be proud of the complex that we are like part of a very complex uh, practice but mm -hmm. mm, so i think that the when i show you the whole transformation process going from the global melting process and the north atlantic currents there's so many actors involved in the in the uh, sonification process 
but normally you you just yeah you you only addresses very very few of those actors uh, so it, it is this uh, straightforward idea of translation as perfect uh, uh, tra tra yeah that you can translate uh, one medium to another and uh, remain and, and you can keep the kind of authentic information I think that mm, is what I'm yeah. criticizing that, that really makes sense now with what you were I guess citing about your philosophical influences if we like you know you just mentioned Dillas Gattari and maybe some of the students here are familiar with um, Thousand Plateaus or the idea of the rhizome. And I guess so it, it maybe aligns with your critique of a kind of unitary narrative or um, uh, narratives around philosophical truth or kind of, um, yeah, uh, an attempt to bring in some of that complexity that you just talked about. Absolutely, that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah experience an experience a sonic experience i mean there is a we i think we we are i mean i mean i'm 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 turned i turned 50 last last year so so i'm a bit uh, uh, quite much older than many of you here so but for me uh, i've been kind of part of a um, shall we call it artistic slash philosophical discourse where uh, philo philosophies of representations is kind of the 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 yeah the the ruling paradigm within art, which really really um, don't acknowledges all these kind of other other perspectives. I think it looks much better today because uh, and I guess you yeah I don't know what your your theories are if you what you go through in terms of philosophy, but I mean it's it's been enormously I think. Um, uh, amazing how much uh, yeah thinking in terms of posthumanism partly new materialism which at least take these uh, these kind of actors into con consideration there's mm -hmm. other problems with those as well but but that might be another story when you think about the human agency and our responsibilities and things like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah brilliant fantastic okay well, I think we have grilled Ossa enough and she's worked very hard to answer all of our many questions. Thank you so much for your presentation and for answering the questions. And thank you to the students for a brilliant set of questions. Um, yeah, really brilliant to have you. And um, hopefully maybe the next time any of us are in the areas where your installations are permanent, we can go and visit them and enjoy them. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I, will, I really enjoyed it. And again, thank you for all, all fantastic questions and your, your enthusiasm very much. Yeah, really appreciate yeah. that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll wrap up the session there. Um, thank you so much again, Asa. Um, students, I will see you all next week when we have Richard Phoenix as our guest. Uh, and I wish you all a very lovely rest of week and weekend ahead. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you very much, Annie. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.